Today we are looking at a case from the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Chester Gillette was born on the 9th of August, 1883, in Montana. But when he was very young, his family moved to the picturesque city of Spokane in the state of Washington. He had a nice and comfortable childhood, and his parents, who were very religious, often toured the western part of the United States while undertaking voluntary work for the Salvation Army, and they would usually be accompanied by Chester. As Chester had travelled so much with his family, he had never really settled for very long in any one particular school. So in 1900, concerned that he may need more education, his parents sent him to school in Ohio, but Chester was not a good scholar and never applied himself in his lessons. After one year at the school, he left and tried to find a job. Once during his school holidays, he had worked for his uncle at his skirt factory and he had worked hard. So after briefly working in Chicago, his uncle offered him a position in his business. Chester was really happy to accept this opportunity, so packed his bags and headed to the factory in Cortland, New York. While working there, he would always find time to speak to the many young ladies who were employed at the factory, one of whom was the very pretty Grace Brown. Grace was born on March the 20th, 1886, in the small town of South Osalik, which was 25 miles from Cortland. She had lived there with her parents, brother and sister, and was brought up on a farm. She had grown up to be a very pleasant, and charming young lady, and having spent much of her childhood helping her parents in the fields they owned, she had a very good work ethic, believing that hard work would lead to a happy and successful life. Grace, however, did not want to stay in South Osalik or stay working on the farm. The start of the 20th century was an exciting time. The US economy was doing well, and things like the telephone were in wide use. Electricity had arrived in the larger cities, and the first silent movies had been made. Grace's sister, named Ada, had recently married and gone to live in Cortland. Grace liked visiting her sister, and she really liked visiting the shops and seeing all the fashionable ladies walking down the streets. So when the opportunity arose to work in the Gillette skirt factory, Grace left her parents' home and went to live with her sister in Cortland. At first, life seemed good for Grace, but tragedy struck when her sister's son died. Devastated, Ada and her husband decided to leave the city and make a new start elsewhere. So Grace rented a room in an old farmhouse, a short walk from the skirt factory. Her landlady was named Mrs. Wheeler. Not long after starting at the factory, Grace met Chester. He had done well since starting work for his uncle and had been promoted to become a factory manager and was regarded by the local community as a respectable and charming young man. He had high ambitions and thought that if he could marry into one of the town's wealthy families, it would help him succeed in business. But he liked Grace. She was very pretty and polite and had a very endearing manner. Chester knew that she had come to the factory from out of town and did not live with her parents. He was also aware that she did not know many people, but her family were not rich, so any relationship with Grace would not help him climb the social ladder. Despite Grace's humble background, Chester started to take her out. The couple seemed to be happy, and Chester was pleased that he was doing well at work and was taking out a pretty young lady, but he was not ready to settle down and as Grace became more and more infatuated with him, he didn't reciprocate her feelings. He would often make excuses not to see her, saying he was tired or had to work late. And while Grace stayed in her room in her landlady Mrs. Wheeler's house, Chester would take out other young ladies. However, things suddenly changed when in May 1906, Grace realized that she was pregnant. She was very worried Although at the start of the 20th century, things were changing for women, as industrialization meant more people needed in the workforce, and there were more opportunities for women. 
who are employed in workplaces such as factories, as retail sales clerks, typists, nurses, and school teachers. But unmarried mothers were still looked down upon by society, and Grace was very well aware. But if Chester did not marry her, she would never be able to marry into what was considered in 1906 to be a respectable family. But despite her situation, Chester did not agree to marry her. He was enjoying the bachelor life too much. And because Grace did not come from a high society family, he had never considered marrying her. He told her he needed time to work out the best way forward. Grace returned to her parents' house. She was very worried and upset. She had believed that Chester was a gentleman, but she had now discovered that he had taken out other young ladies while she thought that he had been working late and he had not agreed to marry her. Staff in the factory started to talk and rumours about Grace and Chester's relationship started to spread. Chester became concerned about his standing amongst the staff in his uncle's business and knew that he had to resolve the situation. Grace did not give up on marrying Chester and wrote a letter pleading with him to marry her and not leave her to be an unmarried mother looked down upon by early 20th century society. She knew that if he did not marry her, she would almost certainly have to stay living on her parents' farm and raise the child alone. However, in early July, Grace received a letter from Chester asking her to meet him on July the 10th in the village of Dereiter, which was about 11 miles away from South Osalik. She was both relieved and excited and quickly packed her suitcase. When the day arrived, she hastily made her way to the meeting point. She convinced herself that Chester was going to marry her and everything was going to turn out for the best. But when she arrived at De Reuter, Chester had arranged for them to take a trip by train to the beautiful Adirondack Mountains. Grace was surprised, but pleased to be going on a trip. Her main concern was her pregnancy, but at last she was with Chester again and convinced herself that he must have planned to propose to her. They first arrived at Utica before spending the night of July the 10th at a hotel near Tupper Lake. The next day they moved on to the very picturesque Big Moose Lake, checking in at the Glenmore Hotel. Chester signed the register under the assumed name Charles Graham. The 11th of July, 1906, was a sunny summer's day. So Chester suggested that they rent a small rowing boat and relax on the lake. Grace was very happy and thought that this was when Chester was going to ask her to marry him. Grace Brown, from a humble farming family who had worked in a factory, was to become Mrs Chester Gillette, the wife of the owner's nephew. She was thrilled and even though she couldn't swim, agreed to go on the lake with Chester. The couple rented a boat from a man named Robert Morrison and Chester told him that his name was Charles Graham. He said that they'd be returning to the boathouse around lunchtime. The couple then set off to enjoy the boating trip on the lake. Robert Morrison, however, could not help noticing that while Grace had arrived empty-handed, Chester boarded the rowing boat with his suitcase, which had a tennis racket attached to it. This was something strange, but he didn't really give it much thought. During the day, the couple were seen by other boaters, some who exchanged courteous greetings. They were also seen having a picnic on the side of the lake. Everyone noted how happy they seemed. But as time passed, they did not return. And as the evening approached, the boatkeeper Robert Morrison wondered where they were. He was not especially worried, however, as the lake was big and tourists sometimes did not realise just how far they were away from the boathouse and would not come back until after it was dark. The following morning, however, they had still not returned and the boatkeeper decided to go and look for the young couple. Along with some volunteers, they set off searching the lake and eventually they found their boat. It was capsized and floating on the water. They searched the area and then saw something in the reeds below. The men carefully positioned their boat over the strange object and as they started to pull it in, 
they could make out the shape of a young woman. When the body had been recovered, Robert Morrison was able to confirm that it was the young woman who had rented the boat with the man the previous day. They continued to search the area, thinking that they may be able to find the body of the young man, but instead they only came across a hat and a jacket. Chester, however, had not suffered the same fate as Grace. He had made it to the safety of the shore, completely unharmed, but instead of raising the alarm, he travelled round the lake, eventually ending up at Eagle Bay. Remarkably, he had planned to meet up with friends from Cortland. The police were contacted and Grace's body was then examined by a pathologist. He discovered that Grace was pregnant and found wounds on her face and head. He told the police that in his opinion, she had been struck with an object before falling into the water. The police were soon able to confirm the young lady's identity as Grace Brown, and it did not take long for them to discover her romantic relationship with her employer's nephew, named Chester Gillette. Three days after Grace's body had been brought up from the bottom of Big Moose Lake, the police came across a man at the Arrowhead Hotel, calling himself Charles Graham. They arrested him and took him back to the police station for questioning. Chester then started to give the investigators conflicting stories. At first he said that Grace had drowned accidentally when the boat capsized, but he later said that Grace was expecting him to propose, and when he told her that he would not marry her, she threw herself overboard. When asked how she came across the blows to her head, Chester said that he did not know. He also could not explain why he hadn't raised the alarm when he returned to the shore. The police were very unimpressed with his version of events and charged Chester Gillette with murder. The trial took place at Herkoma in the state of New York on November the 12th, 1906. And with the extensive media coverage, it soon became a sensation. Hundreds of people came to the courthouse every day. So as the court was full, the crowds would wait outside waiting for updates of the proceedings going on in court. During the trial, the defence claimed that Grace had jumped into the lake of her own doing. They produced letters that she had written to Chester, saying that her situation was so bad that she wanted to die. Chester told the court that when he stood up to try and save her, the boat capsized. The prosecution, however, put it to Chester that he had hit the poor, defenceless, pregnant young lady over the head with a tennis racket. And when she fell into the water, he did not try to save her, even though he knew that she could not swim. They also turned the letters Grace had written into evidence against him, saying that there are a desperate plea from a young lady, asking for the father of her unborn child to do the honorable thing and marry her. Prosecutors also proved in the courts that while Grace was back at her parents' house desperately awaiting news from Chester, he was courting other young women, seemingly unconcerned that his pregnant girlfriend was getting more and more worried about her situation. The trial lasted for three weeks, and on December the 5th, 1906, the jury was sent out to deliberate. They deliberated for nearly five hours before returning to find the defendant, Chester Gillette, guilty of the murder of Grace Brown, and the judge sentenced him to death by the electric chair. He was sent to Auburn prison to await his fate. His defense teams lodged appeals, but they were unsuccessful, and Chester Gillette was executed on March the 30th, 1908. Some people believe that Chester was innocent and that Grace fell overboard in an epileptic seizure. There are rumours that she had suffered from epilepsy. Others will point to the fact that Chester made no attempt to save her or get help, so must have been guilty. They will also remind us that Grace was pregnant and it was 1906, which meant that she would have been a burden to him when he was trying to win over the daughters of the wealthiest residents of Cortland. It is reported that a couple of days before his execution, Chester confessed his guilt, but if this is true, the exact details were never released. And as for poor Grace, the innocent 20-year-old victim in this tragic case, well, 
Over the years, there have been many incidents where people have reported sightings of a mysterious female figure around Big Moose Lake, and many say that it is a ghost of poor Grace Brown. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case 